Columbia TEDx. Welcome. My name is Linda Salaney, and I'm going to be a little bit audacious. So if I step on your toes, if I insult you, if you want to argue with me, that's a good thing. Um, because I don't have so much as a, of a big idea as I have a question. And that is, why in the world are we still talking about women in the year 2013? So I believe that human characteristics are pretty equally distributed among men and women. And so things like ambition and intelligence and motivation and drive and nurturing, equally distributed. So as we look out at the world, we should see a world where we see men and women pretty equally distributed in occupations, in families, at positions of power, at certain levels of salary, but we don't. We see a very gendered world. So I want to explore why and I want to challenge you to do something about it. Let me give you a little bit of history. Women got the vote in 1920, and then there was a kind of huge change in our society. We moved from an agricultural environment to a manufacturing. Um, we had two world wars and a depression. But with the exception of the Rosie the Riveter moment, not a whole lot changed for women until 1960s. And then women went to college in droves. And we waited patiently for the pipeline to work, pretty confident that once we had qualified women, whether they were in binders or not, <laughs> that the world would change. And for a minute, it looked like it was going to. 1981, the first Supreme Court justice appointed. 1983, first woman in space. 1984, first woman on a major party ticket. 1987, we figured the pay gap out, and it was 68 cents to the dollar. 1993, more women elected to Congress than ever before, and uh, the Equal Pay Act passed. 1996, Madeleine Albright is Secretary of State. 2004, Coppola wins Best Director uh, for Academy Award. But as I stand here in 2013, despite the fact that the um, that the pay gap is now 82 cents per dollar, uh, I see a highly gendered world. And I see a world that's calling out for fundamental changes in our organizations, in our societies, in our families, in our homes, in our expectations of ourselves. And I don't see a lot of people stepping up to make those changes. As a matter of fact, what I hear is, let's not worry about the girls. We really need to worry about the boys. Let me tell you, we need to worry about both. So here's a reality check. Women are going to college in extraordinary numbers, more than men, but we're starting at salaries lower than men in almost every occupation. We're in corporations, but we're rarely represented at the C-suite. 3% of CEOs, 14% of senior level execs, 15% of boards. We're working in hospitals, 73% of managers are women, 18% of CEOs. We're running for office, but not getting elected except in Minimal, minimal numbers. 98 of 535 congressional seats are held by women. 12.9% of the South Carolina legislature. Thank God for Louisiana at 11.9%. <laughs> so this happening despite the fact that women have the credentials and we have demonstrated excellence in every area, including that if boards have women on them, they make more money. Now, I come from the hell no, we won't go, we're not going to take it anymore, I am woman, hear me roar generation. We change the world. We change the world. And we deserve applause, trust me on that, because it was not easy. I work with women every day, middle school students, high school students, emerging leaders, corporate women. So you all seem to be more of the, hell no, we don't have time to go. <laughs> hell no, somebody else will go. Hell no, wait till the old people go. <laughs> my favorite, actually my least favorite is, hell no, it's going to blow anyway, so why go? Generation. You did not expect to be fighting for gender equity but you inherited a world that is crying for systemic changes, and you have got
got to step up. You've got to. So I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I am going to tell you what areas uh, from the research need attention, and there are three of them. One is the toxic air that women walk through every day. We know about it, but we it seems so silly. Second is brain research that we're a little bit afraid about because it seems to be reinforcing gender stereotypes. And the third is the dirty little secrets about what women believe about women. Toxic air. You all know about women's clothes and boys' clothes and girls' clothes and toys and if you don't, go walk through a department store or a toy store. But we get the messages pretty early about what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to like. Um, the media is filled with messages. Um, Entertainment Weekly the other night had a great little ad about how to get pouty lips, you know, with the right lipstick. I tell women it's like walking through uh, cotton candy. I mean, you grab it. It seems pretty substantive, you know? You take it over to tell somebody about it, and it's, it's little, it's, it's silly, and it makes me look silly to talk about it. Alabama versus Notre Dame. The quarterback's girlfriend is hot. The announcers remind us of that pretty regularly, right? Uh, lots of chatter online afterwards. You know, it's like, should they apologize? No, it's okay to call a woman beautiful. I mean, this is not a big deal. Miss America was asked about it. It was a silly moment in history, unless you were a teenage girl in America, or unless you were a corporate leader trying to balance gravitas and femininity, and then you got the message, you got it really loud and clear. Women live in a convoluted world, we walk through a world where we're expected to be demanding and family-oriented and nice all at the same time. <laughs> we walk through a world where we're supposed to be directing and provocatively submissive. We walk through a world where we're supposed to walk between bitch and bell, and it is a tough line. And if you don't think that that impacts women, read Anne Marie Slaughter's Can Women Have It All, Sally Krawcheck's Let's Face It, Men and Women Are Different, the most recent Harvard Business Review, Six Paradoxes Facing American Women in 2013. We are questioning whether careers are worth it or whether it would be easier just to give up. And if you do, we go back to that hiatus between the 20s and the 60s when not much happened. Toxic air. Brain research. We know a lot more about the brain. We know that there are significant gender differences in architecture. And we also know that those brain differences sometimes reinforce stereotypes. So we know men's brains are bigger. And we, yes, they are. And we know women's brains have more connective material between them. We know when you do a task, men's brains and women's brains light up differently. So you can believe, as some people do, that the brain is destiny, that it is the way we are. That's my brain architecture, that's just the way I am. Or you can believe, as I do, that the brain is a series of muscles. And just like I go to the gym to work, work on muscles um, on, in my body, I need to work on muscles in my brain. So what muscles do women need to work on? One, we need to work on not caring whether people like us. See, we're very sensitive to faces and we're very sensitive to voices. And I'm standing up here looking at this audience and going, do they like me? <laughs> I've got to be able to say, I don't care whether they like me or not. This needs to be said. Second thing women need to work on has to do with negotiating. We know there's a pay gap. We know that there are lots of reasons for it. But one of the largest has to do with salary negotiation. Great study, MBA students from the best colleges in the United States, men and women, corrected for undergraduate degree, years of experience, prestige of college. You know what? The women made less than the men. Why? Not because there's discrimination, because the men negotiated salary. Women don't negotiate. We got to learn, though, before you start at the salary level, how to negotiate. We need to start learning when we're five and six and seven years old. The third thing women need to work on 
in terms of the brain has to do with uh, whether or not, I've forgotten my point, so we'll just skip that one and move on to the things men need to work on because men really need to work. <laughs> the first thing men need to work on seriously is listening for meaning. When men's brains are working, when they're reading a book or they're in a meeting and they're listening, they're listening for the issue, the issue, the issue, the issue. Once they get the issue, you stop listening. What we know is that the issues are more complex. So you've got to hold back on that stop and listen for meaning. The second thing men need to work on is toning back their competitive nature. Great study of how you get paid. So a whole audience of people like you all are getting paid for math problems. And in the first 50 rounds, you get paid by how many math problems you get right. Okay, If you get them right, you get paid. Second 50 rounds, you get paid by how many math problems the person that got the most right, winner take all, competitive. So after 100 rounds of math problems, they ask the audience individually, which would you like? Do you want to go with the collaborative, everybody gets paid, or winner take all? Men extraordinarily chose winner take all, even when they'd lost every time. Women overwhelmingly took the collaborative. Let's spread the pay around, even when they'd won every time. Third thing men need to work on is not feeling like they need to fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. You all have what Lou Anne Bresnadine calls a lean, mean, problem-solving machine as a brain. And Lou Anne Bresnadine wrote The Male Brain. She says men want to fix things, so you jump into action very quickly. Pausing. Now, here's the kind of sad thing about brain architecture, is it worked back when, but it doesn't work now. Back in the cave days, that brain architecture worked great. We just haven't changed it a whole lot. And unless we practice the muscles, we won't. So we walk through toxic air, and we walk through with a brain that tells us to be a certain way, and we hold some, hold some very interesting beliefs about women. Now, this comes from talking to women, and it comes from research. One, women don't like women. We really don't. We'd rather play with the boys. They're easier, they're more fun, and we get things done a whole lot more if we play with the boys. If you talk to middle school girls and you ask them, would you rather work with girls or boys, there is no question. And the same thing's true at the C-suite. Unless we, and we know that unless there's some individual positive experience with women, we carry this belief system that women don't like women. And why do women not like women? Well, women don't like women because ugh, we are mean, backbiting bitches <laughs> who will stab you in a heartbeat, and what's worse, who will pull you down as soon as we can. And our lives are full of drama, so it just eats up time. <laughs> the third thing that women believe about women is that there is an inverse relationship between likability and competence. Uh, Colum study at Columbia University, a case study shared with an entire audience like you all, and they were asked to rate the executive. Um, the only difference was that half of you got an executive named Howard and half of you got an executive named Heidi. Howard and Heidi were both good. Howard was loved, Heidi was not. So here's the bottom line. We haven't achieved transformational change. Women aren't going for promotions. They're not promoted um, in rates that we'd like to. They're leaving work. They're starting businesses, but they're not growing their businesses. Um, we're creating, net creating networks, but, not, but for relationships, not for business. And here's the really sad thing. The problems are not governmental. They're not discrimination. They're not caused by men and they're not going to be solved by money. They are very subtle problems that have to do with our society, our biology, our media. And until we address them, 
we're going to be stuck in this same period. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to move out of that hell no, we won't go attitude and go. I don't know how you fix them, but I know you got to. It's your time to lead. It's your time to lead and to talk about these tough issues. My generation, we took the bind, we, we made the pipeline work and we delivered the women. Your generation has got to be able to type, take the binders off women while they're in the pipeline and make sure that they arrive at a level playing field. If you don't do that, we will be in 2033 talking about, so honey, like why are they still talking about women? <laughs> I'm serious. Why are we still talking about women? Because what you have to change now are hearts and minds. The laws, the policies, they've mostly been done. So here's what I hope for you. I hope that you walk out of here and do something different about this. I hope that you become the hell yes, we're going to address <laughs> this one. And I hope that you make the difference so that South Carolina works for everyone and so that we live in a world that our sons and our daughters deserve. Thank you.